What I'd like to do now is to move on to some industry updates and perspectives. Now, clearly what we've seen here is a whole lot of new technologies which are going to come about. How do we know what's going to be most relevant to us? Well, in the, the uh, short term, I, I, I think that the, our industry representatives are going to be going to give us the best indication of this. So I think it's, it's very important to see what is coming out there uh, or what's coming coming out to us in our environment. And, uh, and to start, I'd like to ask Mike Wood from Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association to come up and talk to us a little about 4G technologies. I'll just get this going. Oh, you're using your own laptop. No, no. no using Well, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, and the organisers, thank you very much for inviting uh, myself to represent uh, AMPTA here today to give you an update on 4G telecommunications technologies. And what I'll be presenting is an overview of uh, really from 1G to 4G to see where we are today and the sorts of uh, the technology that we use and the technology that's available. I'll also be um, giving a, an overview of what the, uh, the mobile phone and data usage is like. Um, we've all been, we've all, we're all familiar with smartphones and tablets and the increasing amount of data that's uh, being used on the networks. Well, I can give you a, an overview of what that, what that looks like today. We have a, uh, we will be uh, showing you uh, an exciting new initiative called Mobile Site Safety and I'll be um, talking about that shortly. And then I'll summarise with um, looking at the deployment of 4G and the new technologies and how that impacts on our EME compliance. So, times have certainly changed. Now, I thought I'd put this up to look back uh, over 25 years of mobile technologies in Australia. Um, now, I don't know how many of you here remember the various handsets we have there or whether you own up to having the first one. Um, I, think, uh, I think when I first started with, uh, with Telecom, um, I certainly had one of the second phones there. I think that was one of the, those Motorola's were made, uh, were made famous by a couple of uh, actors in the movies. But the first one there was the bag phone. Uh, it was often referred to the bag phone. Most of the bag was a battery. And, uh, and then of course you had the handheld device, the, the handset device. Um, and of course right up in 2013 we've got the, uh, you know, the new 4G devices that are available now. Um, and a range of devices in between. We've seen, uh, you know, handset manufacturers come and go in terms of popularity of, uh, of phones. But uh, that gives you a snapshot of what the actual devices look like. And at the very beginning here, back in 1987, I think we were looking at costs of in, in excess of about $5,000 for the first for the first mobile phone. So compared to what we have now, there's certainly been a significant change. In terms of uh, data and the calls. Um, here is a graph um, produced by Ericsson and they've looked at the global statistics on uh, the number of phone calls people make and the data that's used over the networks globally. Now what you have here on the vertical axis, and this took me a while to get my head around the sort of figures here, we're talking of petabytes. Now one petabyte is a million gigabytes. Now on the axis there, this is the upload, uplink and downlink data per month. So if you look along, I don't know if you can see it, but on the bottom scale we've got the years divided into, uh, oh they're sort of in months, they're in quarters. Um, but certainly from 2011, uh, if I get the pointer, you can certainly see an astronomical or an exponential rise in the, uh, the amount of data that's being uh, used over the networks. The level of phone calls is reasonably, um, reasonably stable, so that's the amount of phone calls that are occurring per month. But certainly the level of data is increasing. Now this is globally, and it would be fair to say that this would be representative, uh, in Australia, this would be representative of what we're seeing in terms of that rise in the amount of data. Um, so there's certainly a lot of demand on the network to meet that, um, to meet that data. In terms of technologies, 
Um, I don't want to go into all the details, but I thought I'd spend 60 seconds to take you from 1G to 4G and then look ahead to where it's going. So back when we saw that very early phone, that large bag phone, that worked on the, uh, the AMP system, which was the analog network. And that was referred to as the uh, first generation of mobile. Now AMPS, or the analog network, stands for, um, for Advanced Mobile Phone System. A lot of people uh, just called it AMPS, but it was Advanced Mobile Phone System. It used, a, it used an FM transmitter, so the basic transmission was FM, like we have with our radio stations, quite a narrow bandwidth, and you needed one transmitter for every single phone call. So a, a mobile base station typically could handle between 90 to 100 phone calls, and you had between 90 to 100 transmitters at most mobile base stations. We move forward in time, and you could only handle voice calls on the 1G network. So when 2G came along, which was known as GSM, GSM stands for Global System Mobile, or the French term is Group Special Mobile. And this was a pulsed uh, system. So instead of one transmitter handling one phone call, basically what they did is they said, OK, with this technology, if we can switch the transmitter on and off at a certain uh, time per second or a certain time per minute, we could fit more phone calls in. So what they did is they, they broke, the, uh, broke the transmission down into groups or into, um, uh, in to be able to handle eight phone calls. So by pulsing the transmitter on and off, you could actually handle up to eight phone calls per transmitter. So if you look at the efficiency gain, you've, you've got up to 100 transmitters per base station for the 1G network, and suddenly you can reduce that down significantly. So you might have uh, between three and four per sector, or maybe up to 12 transmitters per base station. Now they operated at similar powers, so you've seen a reduction in the, the amount of power needed and to handle the same amount of phone calls. Now on the, jet, on the 2G network, uh, we had the introduction of uh, SMS, and some data. You could transmit some data over the 2G network. And it used frequencies of 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz. Um, also on 2G came along the CDMA technology. Now that was very popular in Australia. It was, it was a replacement of the analog network and it was mainly used, uh, well, it was used in the city and the country areas, but it was a, a very good network in terms of its depth of coverage. Um, instead of a pulsed signal, they applied what was originally used in the military, which was a, a sophisticated coding uh, sequence. CDMA stands for Code Division Multiple Access. Now, what they did is for every single phone call, you applied a specific code at the start, and the receiver had a, a sp the same code to decode that signal. And through the advanced technology of Code Division, you could handle significantly more phone calls than you could on the 1G or the GSM networks. Um, so it was a very advanced uh, technology for its time. It could handle voice, uh, data and text as well. Then along came the third generation of uh, mobile. Um, now, third generation used a wideband version of CDMA. Basically, it was the, ad the advanced coding mechanism, but it used a wider bandwidth. And that meant that you could get more data over that wider bandwidth. And we also, it also introduced some new frequencies. The 2100 megahertz band was used for 3G initially. And you could get fast data over the 3G network. So it handled voice and data and fast data. And then the, the technology moved on to 4G. It was, well, it, it, well, it is known as LTE and LTE Advanced. Now that stands for long-term evolution. So LTE is the uh, acronym for long-term evolution. And it's a, um, I guess it's an ev evolution from 3G. So these technology standards are basically one evolves from the other. Now, it uses a frequency and time component to form a grid, like a matrix grid. And in terms of the coding, it still uses, it still uses a, an advanced coding algorithm. But because it applies it over a grid, you can actually get far more data over the same transmitter. So basically the coding mechanisms are more advanced and we have one transmitter per frequency band in the uh, LTE um, or in the 4G, for the 4G technologies. Um, because they use a much wider bandwidth, uh, in you, can, you can use up to 20 megahertz or you can actually combine 
um, the bands and stitch them together is what they, they often refer to. Um, you, can, you can transmit and receive significantly more data over the 4G network. So I guess what we've seen here is uh, an evolution from 1G to 4G and uh, I think it was mentioned before, it's certainly been advertised in Melbourne recently, uh, the, the analogue television network or the analogue uh, TV is being turned off in, in the Melbourne metropolitan area I think next month. But over the past few years the analogue network has been progressively switched off around the country. And they're re-farming they're re some of the spectrum, so for example in 2015 um, the 700 megahertz band will become available, it will move from television to become available for uh, um, 4G. The other bands that will be available will be 2300, 2600 and 3500. Now this is to handle the uh, data loads we were just seeing before, the increased data. So in terms of uh, what does it actually look like, well you probably don't know whether your phone's operating on 3G or 4G. At the moment, uh, all the voice calls are handled on the 3G networks and the data calls are transmitted over the 4G network if you have a 4G compatible phone. So when you're transmitting data, it switches to the 4G network. When you're making a voice call, it uses the 3G network. But effect is essentially, the main difference between the, you know, the technologies is the type of radio signal. And the differences are the signal bandwidth and the modulation type. So it's all radio. We heard the previous presenter, Andrew Wood, talking about the technology before. This is using radio frequency and it's just a different modulation type and certainly a far more advanced uh, you know, and far more efficient uh, technology in terms of 4G. What I'd like to do, uh, actually just before I do that, um, I just wanted to uh, make sure I clarified a couple of points. Um, I said that uh, 4G was an evolution of the 3G technology. Um, it does use similar transmitter powers. One thing that I should mention here is that even when we've come from 1G, 2G, 3G and 4G, we're, they're all using very similar transmitter powers. We're just seeing the efficiency of the technology being well, significantly advanced, I guess, so that the capacity and the data usage can, can be handled in a better or in a more efficient way. And the additional spectrum, some of the spectrum is, uh, is being re-farmed, like I mentioned, from the TV frequencies. Now, um, many of you will be familiar with the internet database that we use for mobile base stations called the Radio Frequency National Site Archive, or the RFNSA, as it's known. Um, it's been around for 10 years, it's been publicly available for 10 years, and it was introduced as part of the deployment code, or the old ASIF code, and it's grown over the years, and the last revision of the ASIF code, where it became the deployment code, saw the uh, innovation of a consultation page added for every site uh, through the code committee. What we're, uh, what we're excited to announce today is the launch of a brand new way of getting onto the RFNSA, and it's called Mobile Site Safety. So if you've got a smartphone or a tablet, or you go onto a website and put in mobilesitesafety.com.au, what you'll get if you go onto the, uh, if you go onto the um, desktop, you'll see a version that looks like this, with an interactive screen on the left-hand side, some information and links on the right-hand side. And we've, um, we've included here a new YouTube channel called Mobile Site Safety. And on there we have an introduction to what the app can do. But we've also, uh, we're also focusing on worker safety at buildings and worker safety at facilities. So that there's some, uh, there's some demonstrations of using personal monitors and how to work safely on mobile phone towers. The advantage of this is that, uh, for example, um, I can't show the actual uh, the phone version, but during the break I'm more than happy to help people get set up with it. But it should work automatically if you've got your GPS and location-based services active. It will find your location and show you the base stations nearest to you. And then you can zoom out or zoom in and select whichever base station you want to look at and have a look at the reports. On the uh, desktop, as I mentioned, you can see both uh, the links and the interactive uh, web version here. So it's got a much easier name to remember. Um, mobilesitesafety.com.au or mobile site safety is a lot easier than having to remember the acronym RFNSA, which even after 10 years I sometimes get wrong. 
Um, but uh, the RFNSA will still be available through its normal portal, but the, uh, certainly the new version will be much easier to use. Now I can demonstrate if this works. It's always risky giving a live demonstration during a presentation. Okay, so what I've done here is I've gone onto the website and I was on there before, so I'm just hoping that the uh, internet's still up. <coughs> and on the, on the uh, right hand side, what you can see are the uses for mobile site safety. So the main uses are for locating base stations, site information such as the carrier contact details, the reports and the location, and the safe work procedures. Um, I've mentioned the safe work procedures, the environmental EME reports, or the ARPANSA reports as they're known, and the compliance documentation. And you can get access to the YouTube channel as well. Now what it's done here is it's brought up the uh, website, uh, it's brought up the interactive part. It's located where we are in the uh, RMIT theatre, and that's using, um, that's using the, a Wi-Fi or the, the uh, location-based mechanism of the internet. And it's displaying an initial list of 20 base stations that are located in this immediate vicinity. Now what I can do is I can, there's a, um, there's a plus sites button at the top here and it'll bring in another 20 facilities. Now there's lots of base stations in a CBD area but if you're a worker and you're in a suburb or if you're in a country town and the idea is that you pull up to, it's, it's virtually the, uh, the equivalent of dial before you dig, the mobile version of dial before you dig. If you're going to work on a rooftop um, and it's got an antenna on it, you can bring up mobilesitesafety.com and have a look at the safe work procedures for that particular site. Uh, it's also useful if you don't have location-based services, you could search for a suburb. Now, the YouTube clip shows a, uh, an example we did out in Vermont. So just to demonstrate that. It's... Uh, it's linked into Google Maps, so it, um, it links and populates the suburb name quite easily. Um, there's a site here right next to the Little Man. This is on the corner of Canterbury Road and Baronia Road. When I click on the site, it pops up an information box to tell me who's there. And in this case, it's Optus, Telstra and Vodafone. And when I click on to the... Uh, when I click onto the site information, you can see the EME Safe Work Procedures tab, the carriers. So if you wanted to find out which carriers were there and how to contact them, once you click on there, and this is very useful for workers and for the, uh, for the public that wish to get in touch with a particular organisation, you've got the uh, postal address, the email and the phone to contact the carriers by. If you're a worker at a site like this, then the safe work procedures are going to be important to you. And there are 10 steps for working safely. I won't go through them all, they're listed there. But if you need access to the uh, specific site information uh, for a particular site, you can request a login from the carrier and or the facility manager. So if you think about, you've got your smartphone or if you're a worker with a tablet, it looks terrific on the iPad or a tablet version. Wherever you are, you can look at the sites nearest to yourself. And you can, in the search options, it gives you an option to highlight different carriers. So if you wanted to look for all of the Optus base stations or the Telstra base stations, you could do that. I think this will be a terrific initiative for community members to locate base stations near them and in areas that they're interested in, as well as for workers. So I'll, we can demonstrate that further in the coffee break later. So, we saw the increase in data before, uh, from 2011 time. Okay, I'll just finish up with this one if I can, Rodney. Um, EME levels from existing base stations have increased due to the capacity upgrades from uh, the increased use of data on the 3G and 4G networks. And I know I'm being hurried up, but I'd just like to show that increase if I could, Rodney. Um, the change in EME, um, if we look back at the uh, ARPANSA reports, um, there are 13,500, just under 14,000 base stations uh, 
in Australia used by the carriers, um, 13,539 uh, to be precise. Um, they all have EMA reports and these are prediction reports done to, um, you know, um, using calculations for maximum uh, capacity. Since in, two, in November 2011, the average of all of those in terms of EME levels was 0.62. It's changed in November 2013 when we pulled this report a couple of weeks ago, it was 0.9. Um, in terms of how do those sites, how do you break those sites up into different categories? Um, well, the one I'll focus on is probably the one on the right hand side. The number of sites that have EME levels predicted to be above 5% of the Arpanza safety limit and that's changed from 108 to 345 out of 13,000 base stations. Now the report, the independent audits and testings show that the uh, reports are generally conservative and I think we'll see a presentation in a moment that uh, highlights that but this gives you an idea of um, how the networks have uh, changed in terms of the increased use. And just to finish up, our main focus is on safety, as you've seen with the app that we're launching today. We do undertake detailed EME compliance assessments at design. Um, both 3G and 4G will be distributed across additional sites so that we can meet compliance and ensure safety at those sites. And some sites may have limited 4G and 3G because the sites are actually at capacity now. Um, and all of our site compliance is veri verified by independent NADA assessors. So um, I'd like to thank you very much.